I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hi, I'm Luke Ryan for JoeBlow.com and welcome to Movie Endings Explained, where we'll be taking a look at some of the more ambiguous and discussed movie endings that have left audiences debating their true meaning long after the credits have rolled. After the recent release of Blade Runner 2049, I felt it was appropriate to tackle the ending of the 1982 sci-fi classic Blade Runner. Much like its predecessor, Blade Runner 2049 seems to be a film that isn't all that commercial, but will go on to entertain and engage the minds of movie fans for decades to come. The original film, directed by Ridley Scott, follows the police detective Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford. Set in a dystopian 2019 Los Angeles, Blade Runner is a wonder of production and art design, creating a teeming metropolis of shadows and neon. This world is not only inhabited by humans, but also by replicants, lifelike synthetic androids used for slave labor. They became too unstable and were deemed illegal, leaving a task force of special detectives no alternative but to track them down and retire them. They were called Blade Runners, and Deckard has seemingly turned away from that life, but just when he thought he was out, he gets drawn back in. A group of replicants have landed on Earth and are very dangerous, Nexus 6 models with a built-in lifespan of four years to counteract their growing sense of independence. Throughout the course of the film, Deckard tracks down and neutralizes all but one of the rogue replicants, that one being Roy Batty, played by Rutger Hauer. Roy is the leader, charismatic, philosophical, his emotional growth has been rapid, and while he won't hesitate to kill, Roy is primarily concerned with gaining more of what he can't have, life. The inevitable showdown between Deckard and Roy at the end of the film is anything but conventional, with Deckard on the defense the entire time. Roy, unstable and reaching the end of his pre-programmed life, toys with Deckard, and eventually they both end up on the roof of a building. Deckard is hanging off the edge, about to fall, and all Roy, the villain of the film, has to do is let Deckard fall and die. But in one last act of defiance, Deckard spits at Roy, falls, and is saved by the helping hand of the replicant he was hired to kill. Roy then sits down, white dove in hand, and delivers one of the most memorable monologues in movie history. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Houser Gate. All those moments will be lost. In time, like <clears throat> tears in rain, time to die. It's an unforgettable moment of an artificially intelligent being coming to terms with his artificial mortality. He declares his wonder of life, the fleeting nature of memories, the human experience to an audience of one, Rick Deckard, who says nothing and listens to everything, a look of understanding. Maybe he realized what Roy was fighting for all along, realized that the so-called skin jobs that he was quote-unquote retiring were actually capable of feeling after all. Maybe he was murdering, not retiring, and maybe the fact that someone's consciousness is artificial doesn't change how meaningful that experience is. Earlier in the film, Deckard met Rachel, the supposed daughter of Tyrell, the creator of the replicants. Deckard subjects Rachel to a test and concludes that she is in fact a replicant, and over the course of the film, she discovers this fact out too, and they both fall in love. 
After Roy dies on the rooftop, one of the detectives, Gaff, turns up and alludes to Rachel when he calls out to Deckard. It's too bad she won't live. But then again, who does? At the very end of the film, when Deckard returns to his apartment, he wonders if Rachel has already died, or in fact been retired by one of the Blade Runners. But she's alive, and they leave together. Rachel? And so ends the film, at least the version Ridley Scott wants you to see. I'm judging the film based on his 2007 final cut, which in turn was based on the director's cut. In the original theatrical version of Blade Runner, we see Deckard and Rachel driving through the mountains in a studio mandated happy ending. It takes the edge off of the ending somewhat, both rhythmically but also thematically. One of the artistic strengths of Blade Runner is that it all takes place in the perpetual nihilistic darkness of Los Angeles. The fact that the shots of the mountains were outtakes from Stanley Kubrick's helicopter footage for The Shining is a testament to how thrown together this ending really was. The final cut makes the ending not only more impactful, but less ambiguous. An origami unicorn? What the hell is that supposed to mean? We'd seen Gaff making origami figures throughout the film, so clearly Gaff had been to Deckard's apartment, but also wanted Deckard to know he'd been there. But why? And why a unicorn? Well, in the final cut, and the director's cut too, we have a scene of Deckard at his piano, dreaming of a unicorn. Based on how introverted and quiet Deckard appears to be, it stands to reason that he wouldn't be telling anyone about his dreams, let alone one of a unicorn. So how would Gaff have made the connection? Earlier on, Deckard explained to Rachel how her childhood memories were implants taken from other humans and that he saw this in her file. So it also stands to reason that the only way Gaff could have known about Deckard's dreams of a unicorn is if he saw it in Deckard's file. Thus we get to one of the biggest debates of sci-fi film history. Is Rick Deckard a replicant? What's interesting is the varying perspectives on this timeless question, from the audience to the creators. Harrison Ford wants the answer to be no, Ridley Scott wants the answer to be yes, and the screenwriter Hampton Fancher balks at there even being an answer to the question. The Unicorn is seemingly the biggest case towards the argument that Deckard is a replicant, but some even dismiss this as evidence, claiming that Deckard is actually daydreaming about Rachel's memories, and that Gaff's origami calling card is there to let Deckard know that he can take off with Rachel and make the best of it, even if it would have theoretically been part of Gaff's duty to retire Rachel, and he clearly did visit the apartment. Then there's the eyes. Throughout the film you will see pinpoints of reflected light inside the eyes of the replicants. This was a very specific and intentional effect done with great care to provide that extra visual aid of the unnatural to the replicants on screen. In this scene in Deckard's apartment we see the light in Rachel's eyes and behind her, just out of focus, we see the same glint flash across Deckard's eyes too. When I saw that red shit in his eyes, I said, give me a break, no, please don't. I know, and Ridley's tricky. I think probably that was Ridley's, that's gotta be Ridley's decision. But I said, well, no, no, no. And he, and he said, I, they did that, you know. Leave me alone, Hampton. <laughs> Now this could have been intentional by Ridley Scott, or it could have been accidental, as the two actors were standing right next to each other and the effect could have carried over to Deckard's eyes by mistake. It seemed that Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott were both at odds with each other about this mystery of Deckard's true origin. Whenever I thought that I was uh, possibly being um, uh, positioned as a replicant, I would, I would 
to seek out Ridley and argue against it. Because it was my notion that in context of this world, the audience needed an emotional representative on, on screen that they, that they could depend on uh, being a human being. One case against Deckard being a replicant is that they have a built-in four-year lifespan, and especially with Deckard being in the sequel Blade Runner 2049, he must clearly have been human. Yet it's only ever stated that the troublesome Nexus 6 models had that lifespan built in. Deckard could simply be an older replicant, or a newer replicant. Overall, the answer is absolutely up to you, even if Ridley Scott thinks it's all very simple. And so that at the end of the film, I can have something re absolutely remarkable, which I can illustrate, which is a unicorn. And he goes like that, boom. How would anyone have known what was inside his head other than someone who knew what was in his file that had been implanted in his brain? Can't be any clearer than that. For me, I think either argument works. It affects the story in different ways, but both are powerful outcomes. If he is human, then he has gone on a journey where he has fallen in love with a replicant and seen the true nature of how this artificial life form can seemingly still feel like any human can. If he's a replicant, then he realizes the true nature of himself, and that if it feels real to him, then it's real enough for anyone. In what will absolutely be a spoiler for Blade Runner 2049, so you've been warned, Jared Leto's character Wallace, the successor to Tyrell as the mass manufacturer of replicants, confronts Deckard with the true meaning of his being. Wallace suggests to Deckard that perhaps it was by design that he met Rachel all those years ago, and that it was part of Tyrell's plan to have Deckard fall in love with her. The idea presented is that Deckard and Rachel were designed to be the first replicants to conceive a child. Deckard merely responds with, I know what's real. While many have taken this scene in Blade Runner 2049 to be an explanation and confirmation that Deckard was always a replicant, I preferred to see it as a potential ploy by Wallace to manipulate Deckard, which is the wonderful element in these movies. The truth behind the literal insides of the characters we see on screen becomes irrelevant to the emotions they feel and the decisions they make, artificial or not. But therein lies the key theme to the Blade Runner world. What is it to be real? What is it to be human? What is it to feel? Is Rick Deckard a replicant? The answer is simple, and it's staring you right in the face. Maybe. <laughs>